All right, it's two after six o'clock. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining for uh, our February steering committee meeting for the Near Southeast Area Plan. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. So tonight, I'm uh, going to go over uh, some scheduling for phase two engagement. Uh, hopefully, you all saw the email that went out last week. Uh, and then we're going to do some discussion exercises uh, similar to what we did last month around housing, mobility, and parks and landscaping. So uh, most of the meeting will be uh, discussion. Uh, the first uh, phase two activities. Uh, so uh, we are putting together the online surveys right now. Uh, they will be launched publicly the week of February 21st. Uh, so they will be up on the website. Um, for everyone to take. And again, there will be four surveys, one for each major topic, land use, economy and housing, mobility, and quality of life infrastructure. Uh, people can take one or all of the surveys or as many as they uh, are interested in or have time to do. So we will be uh, promoting that once those go out uh, in two weeks. Uh, and then we have two, as we discussed last time, we have two community workshops uh, that we'll be scheduling uh, divided by topic. So the first one will be on Tuesday, March 1st at 6 p.m. Um, covering the development and housing topics. And then the second one will be on Thursday, March 10th, also at 6 p.m. covering mobility and parks. And then we'll be doing some uh, pop-up and in-person events uh, throughout March and April. Uh, and those uh, have not been scheduled yet, but those will be up on the website once we do have them scheduled. Uh, Councilwoman Black. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to clarify. So when we send out our newsletters on March 1st, will you have links for us to put in? So we'll have for the surveys, we'll yes. have them before March 1st. Uh, the thing the probably the best thing to do is just direct people to the website and they'll be right there on the front page of the website and people can get all four surveys uh, from the near southeast website okay but they'll be up before the first they will be up before the first fingers crossed that's the goal to get off the last okay. week of february so. okay thank you thank you um so uh like i said Hopefully you all saw the email, you're signed up for the Near Southeast mailing list and saw the email that went out this week uh, or the email or the email that went out last week or the email that I sent to everyone on Friday uh, with some share kit information. So we'd really appreciate it if you all could uh, spread this information among your friends and neighbors. Uh, we want as many people to take the survey and come to these workshops as possible. Uh, and the workshops, will be, uh, the beginning portion will be somewhat similar, going over some basic information, but the majority of it will be discussions similar to what we did last month and what we'll do later tonight, uh, again, around these different topics. So folks can come to one or both of the, uh, the workshops in March. Um, so uh, yeah, that's the upcoming activities. Any other questions around these before we move on? All right, great. So uh, like I said, we're gonna be doing a uh, discussion similar to what we did uh, last month. Um, we're gonna have some survey questions. So uh, we're using the same platform, Mentimeter. So if everyone can pull out their phones or open up a, a new tab in the browser and go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And then when you open that up, there'll be a little box and you enter the number 3108. 4707. Uh, and that'll get you into the survey so we can uh, start the discussion. And then uh, Libby is going to be leading the uh, survey and discussion for these housing options questions. So I will hand it over to Libby. Can you say those numbers again? 3108? 3108 4707. It's also there at the top of the screen if you can see. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Looking the wrong way. No problem. Perfect now. Great. I see lots of hearts, so it looks like people are on.
Do you want to go to the next slide, Scott? Okay, thank you. Um, so what we heard in phase one in regards to housing options is that affordable housing is difficult to find, um, plus the increasing cost of housing has led to gentrification and kind of this loss of diversity in the area. Um, and that one of the community priorities is to maintain the existing designated affordable housing that's already in the area. Um, so then to meet these objectives on what we heard, well now, so what we're asking of you all, and then what we'll ask the community to um, is, you know, what are the priorities when it comes to affordable housing and preventing displacement and then helping those that are experiencing homelessness. So we'll have three questions that kind of go along these three lines. So our first question is what types of affordable housing should be prioritized? I believe you can select two options in this case. So the options are senior housing. So those are for residents that are 55 and older, um, units with three or more bedrooms. Um, these are mostly like for families, um, more for sale units, units for those with the lowest incomes, and then permanent supportive housing, um, like for those that are experiencing homelessness. And then you can also choose other if you have something else in mind that's not listed here. Okay, we'll wait a bit to get some more responses. I think we're getting close though. Looks like we've got 11 people. Awesome. Well, it looks like so far our top two are senior housing and then um, units with three or more bedrooms. So I don't know if there's someone that wants to volunteer to speak on why they select, if they selected one of those two, um, what they like about those options, or if anyone doesn't like those options. Yes, Guadalupe. Sure, um, and, and honestly, it's I, I think what I'm seeing more and more so is that we're seeing um, uh, first uh, and second level ownership within these homes within Virginia Village. And as they're getting older, whether or not they decide to stay in their homes, I would love mm -hmm. to see an affordable housing uh, scenario in which senior housing becomes an easy transition. Um, and and it, it didn't even dawn on me until I saw the survey, but I, I think that would make perfect sense for this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Lisa? Um, I didn't pick senior housing. Um, I do feel like, you know, in this area, we've actually had quite a bit of development in senior housing. Maybe it's more assisted living. Um, I picked the units with three bedrooms because I think that that really will attract families. And I really do think we do have a very dearth of for sale units that are affordable. I have a friend who um, has recently uh, moved out of Southern California and is just searching for a place to live. And I just started like, you know, looking at Zillow and, you know, seeing what was around. And my goodness, almost everything is $600,000 and up, even if it's a shack. <laughs> and um, so I do think, and I think we've spoken about this before, um, with the push for affordable housing on the rental side, um, when we had the, I don't remember the experts that we had that came to talk with us and that talked about various programs that they are trying to um, in, um, implement uh, with some kind of mortgage, you know, programs or something like that, I think would, would go a long way for this area. Yeah, good points. Thank you. Is there anyone that picked something different I would like to talk about why they picked that? Sorry, I'm having a hard time finding my hand. <laughs> um, I picked units with three or more bedrooms and units for those with lowest incomes. And I feel like they should be together. Um, I feel that there are not enough three plus bedroom units that are affordable for those <laughs> families. 
Um, so I, I feel like that's really important that they're together. That's what I have to say. Yeah. No, that's definitely true. I know that in our developments, I mean, we see so many that are just one unit or one bedroom units, affordable housing going in. Yes, Guadalupe. I would say that because uh, uh, working from the design side, oftentimes these three bedroom units, when it comes to uh, rentals, are the most challenging to accommodate only because they often require uh, corner situations where you have the openness mm -hmm. to exteriors. So oftentimes you're kind of working within one and two bedrooms predominantly being kind of, let's say 70% of the overall uh, unit count. And then um, it's it's great if you can get at least 25 plus percent that's available for uh, for three bedroom units only because they do situate themselves in corners um, and, and they're more prone to that. Uh, developers typically don't like to provide three unit uh, three unit uh, modules just because of the way they lay out against uh, along a flat line, if you will. That's an interesting point. I, I don't know much about the design, so that was helpful. Well, and I, th I think that the comment with regards to the, the, the lowest incomes and the three bedroom units, those two in combination, I mean, that's that's a perfect way of accommodating it. If it's as long as the overall building is accommodating a, um, a lower AMI, then I think you're solving for both. Yes, Lisa. I'm curious about the comment because I see a lot of units um, that have, you know, the garage that you enter through the garage and that there is actually I don't know if it's an illegal bed bedroom on the on that same level, but you enter in the garage, it's below grade, and there's sometimes a, a, a bedroom in there or a study or a storage area. There's almost always a bathroom down there. And then you go upstairs and then you're on the main level and you go upstairs and then there's two bedrooms. So that seems to me that that, is that a three bedroom unit or is that not a three bedroom unit? Those are typically townhomes. Yeah. And, and that's not necessarily a multifamily option that works kind of efficiently within a, a certain area of space. Townhomes are kind of what you're seeing develop right now on, I want to say, is, is it on Holly with Cole? Uh, it's not Cole, sorry, I forgot the name of the group. Um, but uh, those those are great options uh, for sure, but those typically aren't necessarily um, aligned with the reduced AMI. Okay, uh, the apartments you mean? Correct. Right, okay. Thanks for the clarification. Anyone who selected permanent supportive housing want to comment? Yeah, I would just say it, it's it's a need, and um, uh, the choice of only two. Um, there's probably at least three that you know. I agree with the senior housing. I agree with with Jenny's comment about the three plus bedrooms uh, going with those with lowest income as well. But uh, permanent supportive housing for those at the lowest end is really a critical need as well. And I think all areas of the city need to participate in that. Yeah, definitely. Any other comments regarding the types of affordable housing that should be prioritized? Okay. Okay, so the second question is, what strategy should be prioritized to help prevent involuntary displacement? So for this one, you can select three options. Uh, so the options are you're just more market rate units, um, just more supply of housing, more units that are designated as affordable, um, support for existing rehabilitation, so maybe existing homeowners to help rehabilitate their homes, um, financial assistance for home buyers, or maybe you know down payment assistance for first time home buyers, preserving unsubsidized affordable housing. So this would mean that you know naturally occurring affordable housing um, that's not subsidized by the government. Um, so preserving that, having community control of land. So this would be like a community land trust um, that the land is owned by a local nonprofit or community organization. So they'd maintain ownership of the land and an individual could purchase the building. Um, and then, or like rental assistance programs and then other, if you have um, some other ideas. 
Libby, you want to remind everyone what we mean by involuntary displacement? Too. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, so for involuntary displacement, gentrification is kind of the word that I feel like has become very popular. Um, but yeah, so it's um, renters or even homeowners being displaced because you know either taxes are increasing or their rent is increasing, and so they're having to, to move outside of the area. I'm not even sure if gentrification is the right term. Having a look at some of the houses that sold around here recently, it's not because they're all fancy new uh, McMansions or anything. It's the same 70s buildings that have gone up 100% the last five years. Mm -hmm. All right, we get a couple more. There we go. There's one more. All right, so it looks like the top choice is more affordable units and then closely followed by financial assistance for home buyers. So um, for someone who selected more affordable units, um, is there a reason that this was prioritized? Uh, what do you like about this option? I guess I'll speak up just, you know, I mean, more supply at an affordable level of income or affordable level for individuals that want to live in the area. I mean, I think that is just a common sense answer in regards to what's going on with everything right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, Guadalupe. I, I often kind of, um, and, and maybe affordable is, I often kind of equate that to workforce, if you will, so that mm -hmm. I know that um, the neighborhood teacher can still afford to live in the neighborhood uh, is kind of what I'm thinking about. Uh, and likewise, you know, uh, having opportunities where, where people don't necessarily have to work at a, at a, a distance and then have to kind of come in to the area. So I see that as, as kind of more, more work assist housing, if you will. Mm -hmm. And Lisa? You know, I know that it's prevalent in some other areas, but I'm not clear, um, as in Denver, um, whether when you have these kind of boom times like now where assessed values are going up and up and so your taxes are going up and up, that people get displaced because they can't afford their property taxes. And, um, you know, I know that we have an elderly um, or, you know, long time, you have to live in a house for 10 years, if you're over 65, you get a, um, an exemption and that is at the grace of the um, legislature every year. And, um, and I, I, I bet you that helps. But I think in some cases, you know, where these values are really changing, that people can, you know, lose their home just because the property taxes become, you know, just uh, uh, too heavy of a burden if you're living on a fixed income. Mm -hmm. And I do think this past year, the most recent assessment, I think Virginia Village actually went up by one of the highest percentage as far as the property tax increase um, overall for the city. So I think that you're living in your house for a long time, you might have paid off your mortgage or your, you know, your, you know, but you know, your income just gets kind of squeezed after, you know, your, your, your COLA, you know, increases on your social security and, you know, your, the vagaries of, you know, your pensions or investments, if you even have any, you know, if your property taxes go up, you know, a thousand dollars a year, well, that's quite substantial for people on a fixed income. Mm -hmm. And if you have to keep like rehabilitating your home or it needs updates or right. things like that. Yeah, we'll go to Harvey and then Guadalupe. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm confused like always. So we're, uh, Scott mentioned earlier that, we're, that we agreed upon that existing affordable housing should stay in the area and we should focus on that. Uh, we're talking about property taxes. So it just kicked off something. So what is the city or the state doing to keep property taxes low so people can afford homes? Is it only on the home buyer, or the homeowner, to, to make homes affordable, or is there something that the city or state are doing? Um, I, I know there is a a a small uh, uh, percentage that seniors get to save 
on their property taxes, but it's very minimal as far as that. But we keep talking about property taxes are making people move out. How, how is that being addressed? It's something that we can address, but how is the city? Maybe, maybe Paul likes to talk about that. Well, what I, what I would say is that um, certainly comparatively, I think Denver's property taxes are low. Mm -hmm. um, as far as um, additional programs to make them lower, I'm not aware of any. There, there is the, uh, for the first time, I did apply for the, the state exemption and, and found it uh, uh, fairly sizable, uh, 25 or 30% range somewhere in there. Um, but yeah, as far as the city goes, I've heard no plans to attempt to drive it lower because it funds so many critical programs. Mm -hmm. And, and just to say it, um, within the three choices that were provided, one of my votes went to other because it was exactly what Lisa was indicating. It's, it's capturing that, that assessment of that happens at the end of the year that, you know, you, you have the constant rise of property taxes that I have a feeling also kind of lends to that level of displacement. Hmm. Yeah. The, the other thing, oh, I'm sorry, there's hands up. I'll play by the rules. Oh. Um, and then Adrian. Sorry, I'm starting to unmute there. Uh, I can be kind of the uh, <laughs> the wet blanket on the, the tax conversation. Uh, I mean, real estate primarily. And uh, this kind of actually dovetails into what uh, Honorable Cashman was saying there for the kind of, uh, we have really low property taxes in all honesty. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a double-edged sword of, uh, I know they're definitely going up and it is impacting a lot of individuals. Probably half of my client base currently is coming from Texas and California, where they have three to 10x on some of the property taxes. So it's always a tough one that, you know, that can't be the uh, full catalyst versus, uh, you know, a house that I'm uh, got under contract today went up uh, 2x. So from 600,000 to basically 1.2 in two years, um, you know, it's going to be the bigger burden on a, a PITI payment for somebody is going to be uh, on that principal side versus the taxes, which are actually very low for a major metro area. We're third lowest in uh, the entire nation for a major metro. So it's, it's hard to kind of uh, make that the full uh, bad person in, in the situation when they're super low as they are. It's uh, obviously a piece of the puzzle, but not the full catalyst there. I just yeah, want to go ahead, point out a, a couple of things. Uh, one, as, as Councilwoman Black pointed out in the chat, if people saw that, and the majority of your property tax doesn't actually go to the city. Most of it goes to DPS. Cool. Yeah. A lot of it goes to uh, urban drainage and flood control and other things like that. So the city's control of, of you know, how much you're getting property taxed uh, is limited because a lot of it goes to other entities. Uh, the city also does have a separate property tax relief program, separate from the statewide uh, one for seniors for low-income folks. So we do have programs in place to help uh, folks who uh, are struggling to meet their property tax payments. And then to get back to Harvey's question of sort of what can we do about it, that's sort of what we're trying to figure out is uh, we know this is an issue. We know that some people are being forced to sell their homes because they can't uh, make the property tax payments. Um, and so, yeah, what, what are the solutions? That's, that's something we're going to be trying to come up with and we're going to you know, be hearing from the public and also talking to, to experts in this field to, to come up with solutions uh, for near Southeast, but um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a difficult problem that uh, hopefully we can uh, try to tackle, but I don't think we're gonna solve completely, certainly not with just this plan. Scott, I'll go to you first since uh, the other two have already spoken. Okay, yeah, so when I was selecting the answers for this, I kind of had that thought in mind of those long-term homeowners who have rising costs. Um, so I selected uh, support for existing housing rehab to help people stay in place if they have large costs come up. I also chose um, community control of land because that can help split out the rising costs due to the land value versus the actual value of the home as we've been discussing. Um, and then I also chose other because I know there have been some really interesting programs like Habitat for Humanity helping uh, fund building ADUs on people's lots so that they can 
um, have that as an additional income opportunity and making the most of their land, even if they don't necessarily have the, the money to put down to build that up front. Yeah, great points. Lisa? Um, I don't know if anybody else saw this, but and, I, and it was a couple months ago, but I saw, um, I, I maybe it was an interview with our governor and he was basically a proponent of getting rid of the state income <clears throat> tax. The, you know, what I call the race to the bottom, <laughs> race to being Texas. And um, so I would hope that the powers that be, these folks that are joining us from the city council would push back on such a suggestion because that would only increase our property taxes. People have mentioned that Texas, California, well, California does have an income tax, but they're just a high tax state, but Texas has no income taxes in areas that don't have state income taxes. The burden of government falls on property owners. And so it could get worse. So I do, I do agree that our taxes in, in, in Denver, property taxes are, are, are low, but you know, the struggle for the people on the low income side and the people on the fixed income side still present, persist. Yeah, definitely. Was there anyone that selected financial assistance for home buyers since that was another top one? Wants to talk about why? Oh, Lisa. yeah, I, I, I selected that one because uh, my significant other, when she was going through the buying process, that was one of the first stops she'd made was to kind of check out any of the programs. Um, I know like I think the Colorado Housing Authority had a program that she checked out. Uh, unfortunately, like the interest rates were a little too, um, a little too tough to swallow in regards to like the money up front and everything. So she kind of went a different route. But you know, those programs are definitely where a lot of first-time home buyers start. And you know, the more options there are, um, probably the more people can take advantage of them and you know get into the program that fits for them. And therefore, you know, become a first-time home buyer, be it you know a single-family home, be it a duplex, condo, whatever it is that suits their needs. So yeah, again, that's kind of why I picked that one. First-hand experience. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah. yeah, I did too. And I had, I, my very first home was in Arapahoe County and they had first-time home buyer money. And so they, um, they reduced the amount of down payment required. And as well as the interest rate was, you know, much less, even though it was a high interest rate uh, environment, much less than it was a market rate. So um I think those programs are really quite effective. And um, like I said, I think this was a, a bond issue. So they, that's how they finance that. And so hopefully, you know, programs like that can really get people on a good um, start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Is there one that we haven't talked about that someone selected that they'd like to talk about? Or did someone have another other idea? I think there were three others and I think we've had two mentioned. I selected other, um, I don't know a whole lot about it, but um, I've been hearing more about it, rent control. And I know that's something they have in other places and we don't have, I guess it's against the law to do that here. Um, so that's just something that I would like to add to the conversation. Yeah, my understanding is it's a state law, correct? Yeah, it's prohibited at the state mm -hmm. level. Yeah. Okay, any last minute comments on strategies for preventing involuntary displacement? Libby, mm -hmm. what is the main reason, <clears throat> excuse me, or what are the main reasons that people are involuntarily displaced? Yeah, I think, I mean, with, I would say, I mean, with the increasing costs of housing in general, um, but like you think like, like rent prices have gone up significantly. And so all of a sudden, if someone's been renting a home or even renting an apartment um, and that rent goes up, however, like, you know, several hundred dollars year over year, then maybe eventually they won't be able to afford it and are forced to move a lot of times you know, to a different neighborhood or to, the, to a different city, you know, to a suburb or something outside of Denver probably moving farther away from their job or something like that. So the problem is uh, overwhelmingly large because Denver's becoming barely affordable for anyone in the middle class to live. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Yeah, that, that's a biggie. 
<laughs> wish I had an answer. Yeah, it's, there's probably definitely not a single answer that will solve it either. There's probably gonna be several strategies, which is why we have a lot listed here and why you all got to select three options instead of just one. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments about this one? Okay, we'll go to our last question for housing. Um, so this one is what types of temporary shelter models would best fit within your neighborhood? Um, so we heard a lot about people experiencing homelessness and when we did our phase one outreach. So these are some different options um, and I'll kind of explain one. I think these you can pick as many as you want for this question. So the what, first one. What do you mean by the temporary shelter, like what the city's doing downtown already or? So yeah, some of those could be options. So yeah, these are temporary shelter or temp different um, housing models in a way for those experiencing homelessness. So the first one's tiny homes. So that's, um, you know, kind of like those tiny home villages that have popped up around the city, um, you know, usually probably like 120 square feet or so. Um, and then safe outdoor spaces are like the legal safe kind of encampments um, have been, that have been put up around the city. Congregate shelters is more of a, a permanent shelter that provides, you know, 24 seven um, shelter service for residents. Safe parking spaces are, you know, designated legal safe parking lots where those that are living in vehicles, you know, can park their car overnight um, and when they stay in their car. Um, Non-congregate shelters are more temporary shelters that would be like in a hotel or a motel. And then inclement weather shelters would be using like a rec center when there's, you know, inclement weather um, as emergency shelters. I look for a few more. That's when you can pick as many as you want. I guess I'll jump ahead slightly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of this right. assumes that these uh, work and are successful. I know the city's been doing a lot of these kind of things recently. Uh, and I'm sure everyone else on this call is aware of all the homelessness and camper van cities that are slowly moving through this area so you know especially in the instances of the mobile homes and all that i'm aware there are safe parking parking spaces available yet they keep getting kicked out from one block to the next so you know this is all great but does it actually work and how do mm -hmm. we attract people there yeah that's a good question um you know, I don't, I guess I don't know exactly how much research has been done on each of these items, but I do know that, you know, when they, when they do it, when the city does each of these, they do provide like, it's kind of like a full wrap of services, I think, um, to those experiencing homelessness. So, you know, bringing in caseworkers and um, trying to provide more of those social services as well. All right, so it looks like the most popular option was tiny homes. Um, is there someone that wants to comment on that? What they like about this option or if people don't like this option? Uh, yeah, what, uh, you know, a few years ago, uh, Councilwoman uh, uh, Black uh, and I and a few of our colleagues went down to uh, um, Austin to see uh, a, a temporary home village they had. Their tiny homes, and they had a couple hundred of them, are not the simple shed versions that we have up in Globeville. Their architect designed tiny homes. They're small, but they're they're far more um, they're far more attractive. If that matters to you, they're far more appealing spaces for those who live in them. And I just think. Uh, it's, uh, 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 I think we need to look at all options at this point um, uh, to, to house people in, in uh, uh, lower income categories in a dignified manner. 
and I think all of these, um, I think, deserve consideration as this planning process moves forward. Yeah, Miranda. You're muted you're if muted. you're talking, yeah. Miranda. Sorry, I was on my phone and so I got confused which mute to push. <laughs> um, I, I think Councilman Cashman probably said everything I would say. Just I just want to reiterate that I do think the issue of dignity is a huge one. And, you know, I think besides that, I think that tiny homes would honestly be more palatable to people who live in communities where they are not such a big fan of, um, you know, safe camping and shelters. But I think that tiny homes, besides offering dignity, also offer safety for the people that live in them because, you know, a perfect example right now is like a pandemic where you can't safely have people sheltered in the same place. And the very little I know about issues related to homelessness, shelters are very rarely considered safe or acceptable places to be. And it seems to me that tiny homes would be a really nice um, alternative. Yeah, that's a good point. Adrian? Uh, my uh, family, my mom actually came up from a very, very small town uh, down south from uh, Colorado here and then you know her family was able to start off but a lot of her relatives when they followed the same suit coming up here um, and I don't know the new non-politically correct term and what I know is the the projects essentially um, I think those would be a good thing to start exploring again is you know are, are uh, those experiencing homelessness aren't just a couple of individuals it's you know reaching in the thousands that you know we need to find how to house a lot of people and quickly um, you know I think finding a, a way to get people on their feet through housing first models has been very effective. You know, Utah has done things like this. Um, but like my mom's family, they were all able to kind of get a foothold and they've been successful individuals contributing to society and had a home to, uh, you know, call their own, uh, you know, through the government as they were called projects then. Yeah, that's a good one. So if you had an other, the housing first model. Yeah, that, that gets back to the first question we asked mm -hmm. here about, um, you know, what types of affordable housing and, and what you're talking about is what we call permanent supportive housing now. That's the, the permanent housing that we try to transition people experiencing oh. homelessness into. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I think that's a good clarification on the name. Thank you. Yeah, but no, you're absolutely right. That's that's the goal is to get uh, as many of these folks into permanent housing as possible. As yeah, and possible. I mean, four, five-story building type things would just be a, a great way to go. And, you know, once you have a roof over your head, it makes life a lot easier to pursue that, not just finding somewhere to sleep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Nancy and then Jared. Thank you. Um, as a marketer, is there a way that you can survey people that are homeless? And I mean, all of us are making assumptions on what they want, but we're not homeless. No, that's a great point. We have we have talked about that. Um, and that is one of the things that we, yeah, we would like to do some um, focused engagement with those experiencing homelessness, especially using you know, a lot of our folks in our um, housing office who do have some of these contacts and have worked with some of the, the social service providers um, to reach out to that population. Absolutely. Great. I think that's really important. Thank yes. you. Because you're right. It is. There are some some questions where it's like, this, you know, we're, we're answering questions about other people in a way right well they deserve that level of dignity right mm -hmm. absolutely thank you yeah is that all right let me yes jump yep that. go ahead i want to make sure uh yeah uh so work with an organization called change the trend which works with those experiencing housing um instability and homelessness in inglewood and um, although it's a very different scale than what Denver's trying to address, um, I do think that the, the smaller municipalities have um, reached some conclusions with some dignity for everybody involved a little bit more so. Um, so I do think there's some people that we can learn from, specifically some of the smaller municipalities when you're thinking about it on a neighborhood level. Um, and it really does come down to individual housing 
um, and su supportive kind of wraparound care for individuals. Um, so I, the only ones that I would like to say, like, don't seem to be working really well in any municipality is the shelters where people are coming in and out. Um, when you talk about safety of individuals, um, it doesn't seem to be like we're accomplishing the things that we want to. Um, and having like really trusted friends uh, serve as the executive director of Rescue Mission and Samaritan's House, I don't think that they would say that that's like where we're winning the battle. So um, I think like the tiny home or the idea of like individual units um, in some way for people seems to be where we want to move. Yeah, that's great. Harvey and then Councilwoman Black. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure how I really want to answer the question of the temporary shelters in the neighborhood. It's asking what would be best fit. And that, that that was real difficult for me to, to even place anything anywhere. What I would like to know is what success rate is there for transitioning people from any of these suggestions to, to permanent housing? Because we could put up whatever we want, but if, if there isn't program, if there aren't programs to actually transition people to permanent housing to improve their life, what's the purpose of this? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if either the council members know the success rate of moving people to permanent supportive housing. Yeah, I don't know. I know once we get folks in permanent supportive housing, it's fairly successful. Uh, I'm not sure about getting folks from these programs in then into permanent support housing, what the success rate is there. Uh, but the point of these is to try to keep people safe as much as possible until we can get them into a permanent housing option. Um, so uh, yeah, and, and as we've talked about, you know, there's wraparound services like go all these to, to try to help people get into uh, a permanent solution. Yeah, once, once we get people out of the, you know, off the street into more controlled environments, especially since we've in the past couple of years made uh, most of our shelters 24 hour a day shelters. We, we have a lot more ability to present them with the option for those important services that can move them toward a more sustainable lifestyle. Now, Councilman Black. Thanks, Libby. Um, I was going to say something before we the conversation turned a corner a little bit, but um, homelessness is an enormous issue in our city, and so I, we're kind of dabbling in it, but I just wanted to assure everyone on the call that the city is spending many, 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 many millions of dollars trying to address homelessness. And Nancy, your point that we should ask homeless people what they want, well, we do. Um, Councilman Cashman chairs a committee. It's the safety, I don't know the exact name, safety, housing, something committee. And if you're interested in everything that the city is doing, you should tune into his me meetings on Wednesdays at 1030 in the morning. Every week we have presentations and contracts we are approving. And we have thousands of people trying to help people who are homeless. So I just want everyone to know that this is a top priority for our city and we are spending a lot of human resources and financial resources on trying to help people. Um, and I like the options you gave us. I am one of the people who um, selected tiny homes. Um, and the reason I like them for, it, at least for my district, which is very suburban. Um, in fact, most of this whole <laughs> near Southeast plan is suburban, but it, they just seemed like something that um, if we could have a small tiny home village, it would be something that would um, complement the suburban nature of um, this part of Denver. And I also selected inclement weather shelters because when there is inclement uh, weather, it is an emergency and, and people need to get in shelter. And then I did put in the chat something about the safe parking spaces. So there's only one safe parking site in Denver and it's actually in my district. 
and it's only for cars. It is not for campers and RVs. Currently, Denver does not have that. It's very complicated because um, we would have to um, have water and sanitation and electricity and such, but our um, Department of Housing Stability is actually looking for some property to have a place where people can park in their campers. That's it. Awesome. You, were, yeah. you were frowning at me, Libby. Oh, I, I didn't mean to. <laughs> well, thank you for those comments then. Um, but maybe Erica next. And then are the rest of you, are the hands up from previously or do you have comments? Hi, um, I can you guys hear me? I'm on my yes. earbuds. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I, this is actually kind of back to uh, Councilwoman Black just now about the campers. I have noticed an abundance of campers lately and I'm wondering, just curious about the legality of them being there. And I'm assuming they're not, supposed to be there, but clearly nothing is being done about them. Um, I had a neighbor the other day who was actually had to go to the hospital because he went and approached one and then got attacked. And um, curious about that. I know it's kind of off topic ish, but I wanted to just address it while we have you there. <laughs> to... um, I can answer that. Thank you. Um, and so can Councilman Cashman. So it's a problem throughout our city. And a lot of people who are living in their campers consider their camper their home. And a lot of them don't like it when you, when they feel like their home is under threat. Um, it is not legal to park anything on our city streets for more than 72 hours. And so people can get ticketed. Um, but one of the issues is a lot of people will get ticketed and they don't care that they're ticketed. Um, they can get towed, but we can't tow a vehicle if someone is inside of it. And there's also very, very limited um, tow trucks that can tow a camper. Um, the city's actually considering buying one. Um, so that is one of the many challenges and Ca Councilman Cashman and I have been working very hard with um, some city agencies trying to solve that problem. Um, I hope your neighbor is okay. Um, and I hope they call the police. They did, yes. And yes, he's doing okay. Um, thank you. And I will relay that because a few of my neighbors knowing I was on this committee were like, can you just ask about this? So I was like, well, I don't know exactly what they'll know, but okay, thank you so much. All right, I, I, we probably have to wrap this up to move to the next one, but from real quick, Miranda and then Nancy. Or did you not have a comment, Miranda? I never took my, sorry, I never. Oh, okay, <laughs> Nancy. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanna thank uh, Kendra and, and Paul for their help with the homeless situation. I'm the president of the East Evans Business Association, and I also live in this neighborhood, and I get constant calls about the RVs, the people that are supposedly homeless, and especially at the Kmart location, and thank you so much for addressing this, and I will relay those messages on to the other business owners on the corridor. Thank you. Okay, any last minute comments or a topic, one of these that we didn't a model that someone's really excited about that we didn't get to mention? Libby? Yeah. I have a question. Uh -huh. For any of these solutions, is the city then required to buy land somewhere from somebody so that, I mean, for instance, 12 tiny homes would have a place to go? Yeah, that's a great I. I'll admit the council members may know more, Scott may know more. I do not think that in certain like safe parking spaces, it might be with partnering with an organization that's willing to have use their parking lot as a safe parking space. Yeah, that's uh, what 
that's what the model's been um, where we've had these solutions or the tiny homes and the safe outdoor spaces uh, in other parts of the city is that somebody, uh, it's often a church or something has volunteered to let people use their parking lot or their property uh, to set one of these up. So most of the time it has been, um, yeah, uh, donated land essentially temporarily. Uh, it could also be sort of excess city land. The city owns some random parcels of land around the city that uh, may have some future use that we could potentially um, you know, temporarily repurpose for one of these. Okay, to me, that would be the biggest challenge of all, no matter what the solution, because land is so valuable out here. I mean, you know, who wants to give it away so that we come up with a, a solution for homeless people? They'd rather sell it to a developer and retire. To me, that would be the biggest challenge. So if the city has it in its budget, you know, to buy land so that some of these things can happen, terrific, you know, but uh, that's probably got to be a biggie for you guys that are working on this. Yeah, that's absolutely um, one of the, the difficulties of, of setting these up is finding land um, that, that we can use for them. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, great question. All right, really quick, Guadalupe, and then I think- I just, Yeah, real, I, I, just with regards to the safe parking spaces, mm -hmm. because I, I think it's fantastic if there's opportunities for this. You mentioned that when it came to RV parking, that the city has to go through an aspect of, you know, uh, water and, and sewage disposal and all of that. When you have these safe parking spots, is there a program that provides opportunities for like a mobile shower unit and, uh, and likewise uh, those services that would definitely assist with that uh, level of, of safe parking spaces? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know if since Councilwoman Black has one in her district, I don't know if she would know the answer to that one. Yeah, the one that is in my district that is at a church and the church is sponsoring it. And um, when they started it, we were, um, they, their church itself was still closed because of COVID. So they made arrangements with the city so that the people could use the shower at the rec center. Um, but I know their idea was that once, um, the church was open up again, they could use the church's facilities. Um, the people who are there are only there from 6 p.m. until 8 a.m. Um, they have a lot of rules. They had to do a, an agreement with the neighborhood. A lot of the neighbors were um, not happy about it. it. There's not been one problem with it. And people who are living in their cars are a unique group because a lot of them are just in an emergency situation maybe they got evicted or something um and they're very open to getting help and so the service providers visit all of our homeless people but the people who are living in their cars are generally people who are more open to service and um, all of the people who've been there have um, transitioned into permanent housing Thank you for that, Councilman Black. That was that's good to know. Um, okay, I think we'll move on to mobility now. Yeah, thanks, Libby. Uh, and so now Jason's going to take us through the mobility discussion. All right. Good evening, everyone. So yeah, we are going to uh, completely transition to a new topic. Um, so that was a really great discussion. Um, and we've got some great notes uh, from you guys uh, in regards to the homeless, uh, or excuse me, the um, housing topic. Um, so we're going to revisit kind of this um, intersection of land use and mobility. So um, as you know, last uh, month we spoke and had some questions um, specific to kind of the land uses in the area. And now we kind of want to transition more into kind of mobility. So moving people from A to B and um, you know, working to improve uh, the safety of folks, um, pedestrians, bicyclists, those that take transit throughout the area. So um, our project team has had a chance to meet um, and chat with um, our fellow colleagues at Dottie. So uh, last month you heard from um, Ashley and Dana. And so we've, we've got a couple of questions for you tonight. 
Um, I do want to preface this by saying this is not an exhaustive list of questions that we're going to have on the survey. Um, we just tried to kind of pick some of those that we thought would kind of spur um, a little bit more of a conversation this evening. And so um, on the survey, you will find um, when that does roll out, there are going to be questions around bike lanes, which we have one for you this evening, um, neighborhood traffic safety, major corridors, and then also some general issues um, surrounding mobility. So things like alternative modes of transportation, and also maybe some other mobility um, questions and uh, options that we have not thought of. So, um, so with that, um, uh, talk a little bit about kind of what we heard during that phase one engagement. Um, we heard from the community that the near Southeast community um, wants vehicles to slow down on major corridors and along neighborhood streets and also wants improvements to help protect pedestrians and cyclists. So um, again, kind of thinking holistically about this, how we can all kind of coexist um, and improve some of the safety and mobility options in the area. And so uh, with these questions, I kind of just kind of, you know, gave you a, a broad overview of the topics that we will be exploring in the survey. Um, but the questions that we are going to be asking are going to help us understand how to prioritize improvements to the transportation safety throughout near Southeast. So again, we are in full partnership with um, our colleagues at Dottie um, to really kind of, you know, enhance and improve the pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure, as well as the transit experience and just make it generally safer for folks um, to move about the near Southeast area. So that's really kind of what the, the crux of these questions are going to be um, for this online survey. So we've got about four questions for, for about four or five questions um, for you tonight. Um, they are specific to kind of that bicycle topic, which we're going to ask here in just a moment. And then also a lot of this does go back to some of those corridors. So we had a lot of, we had a lot of great discussion last month about the corridors in the area. Um, and so we're going to kind of focus on the mobility aspect of those. So the first question um, for you this evening is in uh, relation to um, those of you that um, use the bicycle or are interested in using the bicycle. Um, what is the most what is most important to you to improve the safety and comfort of riding a bicycle in near southeast. Um, so we've got five options for you here um, and you can select one so choose wisely um, improved signage improvements at intersections striped bike lanes protected bike lanes or comfortable local streets and so by comfortable local streets um, you know those are um, kind of these high this idea of a kind of a high comfort bikeway where we have slower speeds less traffic um, or potentially buffers between um, uh, traffic and bicyclists what what is improved signage a great question. So improved signage could be anything from, um, you know, signage pointing you to uh, regional trails in the area, parks in the area, um, uh, specific destinations uh, within near southeast. So just kind of making it easier for you to kind of navigate the area um, on a bicycle. Just to clarify, this is a, a ranking question. So um, rank all five options here. Oh, that's right. Sorry about that. All right, maybe a few more seconds here. Let's folks trickle in. Okay, looks like we've got uh, most everyone that's participated. So um, you can see the results here uh, in the screen. So it looks like uh, protected bike lanes was uh, kind of the first um, priority followed by improvements at intersections. So would anyone like to speak um, as to why they chose protected bike lanes as kind of their first option? Yeah, I'll go ahead and comment on that. So I, I ride my bike pretty frequently during the summer months. And I mean, even during the winter months, I'll be walking down, for instance, like, um, you know, walking down Florida near Holly, and I don't know how many times I've seen people drive literally down the bike lane. Um, and just the thought of that while I'm riding my bike is kind of terrifying in general to think that somebody could just not be paying attention because nothing is preventing a car from actually getting into that lane or alert them to the fact that they're in that lane. So any kind of, you know, protection that can be afforded would be beneficial in regards to just like being comfortable riding my bike more places um, and just, you know, safety in general for everybody. Great, thank you, Spencer. And uh, just for our uh, note taker, you were speaking specifically um, about your experience on the, the bike lane that's on Florida, is that correct? 
Correct. I, I like to take that front. I mean, it's great having that lane to take practically all the way over to university and then, you know, just a quick unprotected jaunt through a quiet little neighborhood uh, to get to Wash Park. So that's always nice. Great. Thank you. Yeah, we, we really like uh, location specific answers. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, looks like uh, Dustin, you have your hand up. Yeah, so I actually put protected bike lanes towards the bottom of my list, um, but it's a survey with limited input. So the reason I did that is I think occasionally, or I have seen protected bike lanes where it's like, well, we can squeeze a bike lane in there and throw a curb in there. And then no one's really happy because it's too crowded for the street. Um, so, you know, some of the designs I have seen Denver and elsewhere, when it comes to this stuff, it seems to be they try to ham fist it in and it didn't really work. But uh, I don't know if this also includes like designated bike, bike ways. So um, back home, we have freeways that go north, south and east. If you go west, you end up in the ocean. Um, but all along those highways, they have dedicated bike routes and they run for tens of miles. So you're not even in, on the road, you have your own kind of bikeway and pedestrians do use it, but it's predominantly for bikes. So it's kind of removes that whole interaction altogether and is like a mini bike freeway, so to speak. I don't think I've really seen that in Denver. Great, thank you, Dustin. Um, Nancy, I believe you had your hand up next. Thank you. So, you know, E7s needs a lot of work. There's no way that people can safely travel that street. So I think signage would be good to move people to different uh, east-west arteries. Great, thank you, Nancy. And uh, if I can ask a clarif clarifying question. so. When you say, um, you know, uh, signage to move folks to kind of the east-west, um, you know, uh, roads, and are, are you speaking specifically to kind of the to bikeways or other destinations in particular? Oh, bi bikeways, okay. uh, Jewel in Florida are very well striped, but East Evans, there's no way anybody can ride a bike on East Evans. Great, thank you for that. Um, I believe we have Erica next and then Lisa. I'm probably gonna say something similar to what everybody else has said, but the protected bike lanes are super important to me, at least for some one way, like on a major thoroughfare to get from point A to point B. Even if you have to kind of go weave around to get to them, I think a protected bike lane on a lot of like major northwest, north, south, east, west arteries would be great. Um, I agree that Evans is probably too tight, but Yale would be great. Um, Oneida specifically, that's um, really important to me because I live right off of Oneida and just connecting from Bible Park to Cook Park safely with children across Evans at Oneida would be huge for my family and all the families that live in my neighborhood. Um, I think that that would be a really, really huge improvement. Great. Thank you, Erica. Uh, Lisa, go ahead. I'm just not sure, you know, over time from what I've seen that um, Denver residents in general as, as outdoorsy and bike friendly as we are, really want to seat streets to the bikers very willingly. Um, we saw what happened on Broadway um, and that really did affect a lot of the retail on Broadway when we uh, when Denver put in a good uh, bike lane along Broadway. Um, there, there was a little backlash. I'm not saying I don't know whether it's good or bad. I'm not I'm not I'm not you know but you know, for instance, Evans. Evans is never going to accommodate a bike lane. It can hardly hardly accommodate a sidewalk. So it's you know it, it's you know I, I I don't see us creating a multimodal you know 
network on every single street, but we want it to network so that we can get to the places that we'd like to on, on a bicycle. I picked improvements at intersections as number one, because I have to say that is where I feel most vulnerable. Um, I don't feel all, well, you know, I don't feel terribly on, on Florida or Jewel, and maybe I'm just lucky and I haven't been hit yet. I'm trying to be, you try to be very vigilant, but I do feel that at intersections that people really don't see you. And um, it's hard to, you know, to make a turn where, you know, it's just hard to get into the lane of traffic um, where there's cars around you. I feel very insecure there. So I'd feel much better if some of our intersections were improved. Of course, Holly and Yale is, I know, on a list um, to have an underground improvement there, but that is a very, very unsafe condition. Thanks for sharing, Lisa. Um, I believe, uh, Scott, you have your hand up. Yeah, I agree with Lisa about intersections. Um, I know for me, that's where I feel most unsafe. And I think even when you're on those um, local streets where it feels really safe and comfortable to bike, even to access the Cherry Creek Trail, um, you still have to go through a lot of intersections that feel very uncomfortable. So I think looking at intersections and helping connect some of those lower stress paths would be really helpful. Yeah, piggybacking off that, specifically the uh, the Holly and Cherry Creek intersection, I don't know how many cars pull into like uh, the crosswalk there. So when you're coming off the trail, like you kind of have to be on the crosswalk to get across it. And yeah, I don't know how many cars have almost hit me there, <laughs> e either if I'm walking or riding a bike. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Dustin just wanted to check, did you have another comment or is that hand up from earlier? I'm bad. Oh, okay. Um, okay, well, before we move on uh, to the, the next couple of questions, and actually Lisa, that was a, a great segue because we're gonna talk a little bit about the corridors here in a minute. Um, does anyone have any kind of final thoughts on um, improving bicycle safety and comfort or want to speak to kind of their, their response to this question and their ranking? Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you for that discussion. So we are going to move on here. So the next couple of questions um, are going to be specific to the major corridors in this area. And so we're starting to kind of notice in these discussions that a lot of the conversation is coming back to these specific corridors, whether it's land use, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, zoning, um, housing, uh, mobility. Um, we're starting to kind of get, get, get a sense here that these corridors are, are major um, uh, kind of um, focuses, I guess, in, in the particular area within the study area. So um, we were working with our folks at Dottie and, and Dottie really wants to kind of understand kind of which types of modes should be prioritized along these specific corridors. So we are going to talk about Evans, Color Boulevard, Leedsdale, and Quebec. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind as you answer these questions. So um, we're gonna ask the same question for the corridor. So the first question is which travel mode should be prioritized along Evans Avenue? And so um, we have pedestrians, bikes, buses, cars, or other. So, feel so free I, to I, I guess on this one, if you know Evans, everyone's favorite hot topic. If we say, let's for argument pick pedestrians, does that mean the sidewalks get expanded at the expense of the volume of cars that can go through there? And then, how do you travel in that direction when one of the main thoroughfares is now half the capacity it used to be? Right. So it's a great question. And it's, a, it's certainly a challenge, I think, that that we would have to solve as, as, a, as a team here and, and work with our folks at, within other agencies. But, you know, to answer your specific question, with a focus on the pedestrians along Evans Avenue, um, you would maybe see more of an investment or kind of a more focus in kind of how can we improve um, the pedestrian infrastructure along Evans. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we couldn't do it on other corridors either. Um, but it's maybe just more of kind of a central focus on, on making sure that, that pedestrians are um, kind of experiencing that high comfort along the Evans Avenue corridor. Yeah, just, just to be clear, there is prioritizing, choosing prioritization here does potentially mean taking away space from other modes. So I don't know that 
in this specific case, it would necessarily mean losing a lane, but it could if we want to prioritize pedestrians or bikes or buses on one of these corridors. It, it seems like that would be the the awkward direction that you would go, right? I mean, would you go about trying to improve the setback requirement of uh, of a double, any new development such that you're kind of similar to what they're doing with Rhino and likewise areas of downtown Denver, where you actually increase the width that's allowed for both pedestrian and uh, kind of a, a green space and or you know bike lane, um, whereas you're not necessarily squeezing out the vehicular because I, I don't necessarily see vehicles being somehow magically taken away from those major corridors. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, it, it wouldn't necessarily mean that, but that's something that could be an outcome. And then what you described, you know, trying to, as properties redevelop, move them further back so that we get more right-of-way space uh, is another way to look at it. Um, so, right, we, we don't know exactly what the solution would be uh, to achieve this, but we wanna understand what people want to prioritize and then we can look at all our options and, and try to come up with a recommendation on how to achieve that uh, so each specific corridor. Just a follow up on that and a clarifier. Has the city previously or ever looked into, we need more sidewalk space here. We will buy part of this property to expand it. Is that kind of, is that even doable? Is it been successful or is it just too cost prohibitive? They've never really gone and done it. It is, I don't know that we've ever done it specifically for sidewalks, but we've certainly exercised our eminent domain power to expand rights of way. Uh, but it is very expensive and very controversial. And it's one of those things that is very unpopular with the people who are impacted. And, uh, and so it, it is very politically difficult. So just one or two more moments here. Okay. So it looks like overwhelmingly uh, folks have chosen um, cars is their, their response here. So we've got a couple of folks with their hands up. So um, uh, Jenny, let's start with you. Um, I really don't like this question. It was, this was painful. I, I put cars because Evans, I, I think it's a thoroughfare for cars. Um, I, I don't think that we need to take away from the cars, but I think we need to make it safer for pedestrians and bikes. Um, so it was a really hard question for me to answer and it hurt. Um, the, the, um, uh, I, the utilities need to be taken away. They need to be buried so that we can make more room for pedestrians. Um, I, so I, I just, I feel like the question should be what improvements need to be made on Evans rather than what travel mode should be prioritized. Evans, Quebec, I mean, all of these main thoroughfares, cars are the priority, but we need to make it more amenable to other modes of tra transportation another way. Um, that's just my thoughts on that question. I didn't like it at all. You made me sad. <laughs> Great, thank you for your comment. Um, yeah, we can look into that um, and work with Dottie to see if maybe there's a little bit more clarifying. And I also noticed that um, I think it was Jared had put a, a comment in the chat about maybe having this um, structured uh, a little bit more like kind of the, the previous um, uh, bike bicycle question in terms of prioritization. So um, Councilman Cashman, I believe you had your hand up next. I'd like to hear from Nan Nancy first. Okay, go ahead, Nancy. Sorry, had to unmute. Thank you, Paul. So, you know, there's a lot of conversation with the East Evans Business Association and the, the businesses and, you know, Evan, East Evans is heavily traveled. Our sidewalks are poor. Um, the, the culture of East Evans is changing. 
you know, the um, Monaco and Evans uh, was Milo's bar. It was a fun place. Um, that's going to be demolished and we're going to have a gas station and a, like a quick mart. Um, traveling west, heavy traffic always. You know, we have a lot of businesses that maybe don't have, they don't have pedestrians visiting them. You know, we have uh, Carpet One is one of the East Evans Business Association board members. Um, we have a, a lot of properties that are, are, have been built really close to the street. So we have a lot of problems. We have a few restaurants, good restaurants, but it's, it's not walkable and we wish that it would be, but it just doesn't feel safe. Paul? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, a, a couple of things. Um, I'm 100% with Jenny. This question made me almost weep. Um, I, I think it, there's so much um, change that, that needs to take place to Evans. Uh, I'll get cranky for a second and just say again, the Councilwoman Black and I have been begging for a full study of Evans for years. And uh, I think it's a shame that that wasn't done before this process. I'm never gonna say prioritize cars, um, recognizing that yes, today, I'm certainly not gonna throw a bicycle out on Evans Avenue. Um, and it, if, if all we're doing is improving it for, for better safety, that's good. But um, I just always wanna take a chance to emphasize the need for improved mass transit in the area and and the comments about sidewalks and pedestrians we have no choice blueprint denver is very clear that the number one priority on all denver streets is the safety of pedestrians so as we deal with evans um we need to improve the sidewalks um and there may be other other options uh i uh, a couple of years ago saw a a plan where the area trail system would connect with the RTD um, right of way, the unused RTD right of way behind the uh, Evans Avenue businesses on the north side. Um, I, I really hope that part of this planning process is, is an aggressive look at how we can create a safe uh, pedestrian and, and bicycle uh, system uh, through our neighborhoods. That's what I've got, and I'm going to stick to it. Well said. Thank you. And it looks like uh, in the chat, Miranda agrees with you about the buses. Um, so uh, let's see. So final thought on Evans. Uh, Christopher, it looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I was probably one of the minority that chose pedestrian. I think mainly I'm, I'm thinking the next 20 years, modes are going to change. Cars go are going to change. And we all keep talking about driverless cars and driverless buses. And I think, yeah, we're not there in the next five years. Maybe the, we're there in the next 10 or 15. And if we're going to spend time and dollars, it should really go towards what it's going to solve, right? And Evans is so car-centric that I think from a planning perspective, we need to figure out from a design standpoint how you start prioritizing the person because then when you're prioritizing it, prioritizing the person, hopefully retail, hopefully design as Lupe was talking about, setbacks might change a little bit to add a little more room. Um, I th think it just might change the perspective a little bit if we start planning uh, that 20, 30 year timeline that it, all these things could happen just because may maybe cars are gonna start reducing a little bit and we've got other forms that people are gonna take. And then we can, again, make that, that corridor much better. Great, thank you. Uh, Guadalupe, did you have one final thought for us? Yeah, um, uh, it, uh, you know, when I saw the, the the fence around Milo's and likewise the Palm Reader in, in that kind of area of, of uh, kind of uh, mall that they had in that location, I actually thought that, I was, I was hoping that that would have been an opportunity for um, affordable housing only because of the reduced parking requirement that has just come out. 
um, with regards to affordable housing. Um, it, it's, it seems like we're not going to get there anytime soon in prioritizing the pedestrian by putting a gas station at that corner, um, just based on, on just the traffic flows that already exist. So um, I, I guess I, I'm asking this question to uh, uh, Representative Cashman. Would you kind of require that any kind of new developments, you know, obviously they have to go through some level of traffic study, most likely, and, and, or unless they're zoned to right. Uh, but I would think that in order to achieve that corridor study, that you would basically require that there's some means of which there is a, any new development that occurs has to submit funding for this future um, study, because inevitably, if we wait for a study to occur, we're never going to get there. Um, and unfortunately, the programs that are currently being associated along Evans are not going to put us in a position where we're ever going to be able to get those options back, i.e. those setback requirements. So I guess I'm, I'm looking at it and saying, you know, there's one thing to kind of push and ask, but is there another way to kind of work within all the new developments that are going to occur in the future that, that this can actually start becoming an initiative? Well, uh, I'll just very briefly say that the uh, the gas station that's going in uh, is a use by right did not uh, require rezoning and I, I guess I would flip it uh, to uh, uh, the zoning team to talk about how uh, parking studies are uh, part of uh, the planning process and if they think that can be improved yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. So uh, yeah, as, as Councilman Cashman has alluded to, um, when a project like that does come through the city, um, it uh, a parking um, study and analysis is part of the site development plan review. Um, and so we have our folks at, within development services that um, uh, do review that to make sure that they are in compliance with, um, with parking and as well as kind of egress in, in and out of the property. Yeah, but those are, you know, right, done as Jason described on a sort of site by site basis. We don't really have a mechanism to require properties that come in for redevelopment to contribute to a, a corridor wide study. Um, that's an interesting idea and something that we could look into to see if we could uh, make that recommendation in the plan. Uh, and to Lisa's question in the chat, yes, absolutely. A, a, an overlay district is. Uh, something is a recommendation that could come out of this plan um, for Evans Avenue. So definitely an option. Great, thank you. Um, okay, Adrian, I see you have your hand up. Do you uh, uh, one final thought here before we move on to the next corridor? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of brutish and of all that too, of, you know, it, uh, you know, getting this thing out might be too late at the end of the day thing because we've had two essential scrapes happened in the last six months that could have been pretty killer spots and both are gonna be gas stations. Um, you know, one closer to the uh, really awful Carvana, which also could have been a great site. Um, gas station is just gonna be uh, south of that. And then now we have another gas station going in, uh, you know, at, at Monaco. So it seems one of those things that, you know, they're kind of playing to what Evans is currently and who knows what will happen by the time we get the study out if it's just gonna be back to kind of revamped Evans, but with gas stations. Good thought. Thank you. Um, okay, Scott, let's go ahead and go on to, I believe we have Colorado Boulevard next. So which travel mode should be prioritized along Colorado Boulevard? So same answers here, uh, pedestrians, bikes, buses, cars, or other. If we just took out all the traffic lights, I think it'd probably solve half the problems. <laughs> And more frustrating than driving down Colorado and catching every single light. Make a left at your own risk. <laughs> All right. It looks like maybe a few more folks will weigh in here, but we can go ahead and get the uh, conversation started here. So you can see a little bit, uh, a little bit of different in terms of a little bit of difference in terms of the responses that we're seeing here. So um, looks like folks are kind of leaning towards maybe uh, buses being more of a priority um, for investment. Um, so who would like to speak as to why they chose uh, buses as maybe their number one?
don't see any other hands, so I guess I'll go. Okay. Um, well, the nice thing about Colorado is it's already fairly wide, um, so a dedicated bus lane seems like a easy one there, especially if they do fix the light timing. Um, and it is a good potential or a good bus route to get you towards downtown as opposed to having to take 25 in. Great, good thought. Um, I think we have uh, Miranda and then Jared. Go ahead. Yeah, I would just, <clears throat> excuse me, I was thinking buses would be good because of the length of Colorado Boulevard. You know, I, bikes are nice, but they're more for short-term travel. Not everyone has them. They're not always weather appropriate. Um, whereas with a bus, you know, per Dustin's comment, there's space that you could potentially do bus rapid transit or a dedicated bus lane for certain hours of the day so that you could actually move it rather quickly. I think that's the, the thing that people get stuck on is that currently a lot of our RTD buses take a long time because they stop every three blocks. Um, so I think considerations to make buses um, functional would have to also include like reducing the number of stops or having um, the ability to get somewhere rather quickly. Great, thank you for that comment. Uh, Jared, I believe you were next. Yeah, just one more choir boy joining the chorus on this one. Um, I feel like the movement up and down from Colorado Boulevard, I-25, Colorado Station, up to Colorado 40th Transit Station, it's maybe the one shot that we've got to move people between mass transit stations in the near Southeast area. So it could really work if we could make it happen. Um, something that moved people quickly from one of those stations at Colorado and Fortis to the other at uh, Colorado and I-25. Uh, Jenny, I believe you were next. Yeah, I, I feel like um, prioritizing buses might be twofold on Colorado Boulevard. Um, when I see bus stops, when I drive from South Denver to Capitol Hill, um, I'm really disappointed about the access to bus stops. Um, so I feel like if we prioritized uh, transit on Colorado Boulevard, it would also um, make better access for pedestrians on Colorado Boulevard. So uh, I think that would be really important. But no one's gonna use the buses if they can't get to the bus stop safely. Good comment. Uh, Miranda, did you have another comment on this or was your hand still up from the last one? No, sorry, I just forgot to take it down again. Okay. Uh, and then... I, I, picked, I picked other because I think it's buses and pedestrians. I think um, because as people have said, because of the width of Colorado Boulevard, there are some more unique opportunities um, and you can tell by just the character of certain areas of of Colorado Boulevard, there are more restaurants. I know this is out of our area, but Glendale has big entertainment center. Um, and um, so I think that Colorado, it's, it's not really horribly pedestrian friendly at this time, just the, the utter size of it and the noise is, is a little disarming, but um, I think that it could be improved. And, and you know, I think the pedestrians, and as Paul mentioned, let's not call it buses, but mass transit, is it would be a good addition and, and, and trying to, um, uh, you know, kind of minimize the car traffic a little bit by ceding some of that space to, to mass transit and pedestrians. Great, thank you for that. And uh, thank you for that comment, Councilman Cashman about the mass transit. I also tend to agree with you that it does kind of open up that door for kind of more creative, innovative uh, technology in the future. So I think that's certainly a change that we can accommodate. Um, any other final thoughts on uh, Colorado Boulevard before we move to Leedsdale, I believe is the next corridor. Don't see any hands. So Scott, why don't we go ahead and uh, talk about Leedsdale? So again, which travel mode should be prioritized along Leedsdale Avenue? So pedestrians, bicyclists, buses, cars, or other?
Okay. Looks like we got most everybody. So a little bit more of kind of a um, diversified split here. Uh, would anyone like to um, tell us why they uh, chose buses for Leedsdale? Looks like that's our number one priority there. Probably for similar reasons uh, with Colorado, I would assume. Uh, Scott, go ahead. Yeah, I chose buses um, just because Leedsdale does have a pretty high bus ridership and it's one of the most direct ways uh, to get downtown from the near Southeast area. So um, prioritizing that movement could really help get people out of their cars if they're heading downtown. Would uh, anyone that chose other like to um, talk a little bit about why you chose that as your your option? I, I'd like to say that you know, just like Jenny, I, 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 you know, and Paul, I, I don't like this question. I don't. I don't think it's answerable, and I don't know if it's a really you know, like on a on a on a on a survey for a lot of it. Just I chose other because it's not one or the other, and so um, and I I feel like. The questions along all of these corridors need to be reworked. That's my opinion. Don't ask me how. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. I, I think um, we've got some good notes here. I think that um, we can work with Dottie on maybe um, kind of coming up with a, a little bit better way to ask this, um, whether it's a ranking system or maybe a little bit more descriptive. So, um, so yeah, those are really great comments um, that we've heard on that. So. And I would, I would concur. I would actually agree with that. I think, I think these are very much leading in, in the idea that you, you're never going to get away from the priority of the, the vehicle being the, 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 the primary means of, of transport along any of these corridors. But by choosing other, you're allowing for a, a, a breadth that can actually take pedestrians, bikes, and buses all within a similar context where we need to improve all aspects of this information um, in order so that the, the car doesn't necessarily become um, the means of, of taking away from any of the other three options. Thanks, Guadalupe. Uh, Nancy, go ahead. So interestingly enough, um, I had a meeting in Cherry Creek today. Um, I had to leave at about noon to get to my meeting, and I was really surprised at how many students were walking along Leedsdale from George Washington. And I thought, I, I, honestly, I thought th this is a dangerous street for these students to be walking. So I think there should be something that we uh, prioritize for students. They, they, they typically, especially at noontime, they go over to the King Supers to get lunch and to the Freddy's and, you know, the places that are around there. So um, that is really tip, typical, typical behavior. And um, so I, um, I've noticed that a lot. Good. Too. I agree with you, Lisa. Thank you. Okay, any other thoughts on Leedsdale before we move on to Quebec? <laughs> Is that a laugh from Councilman Cashman, I believe? I'm waiting to hear the same arguments. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, Scott, let's go ahead and, oh, Jerry, did you have your final thought? Yeah, I was just going to say, I do think Leedsdale is different than all of the other streets because, A, we're working with the state on it. And so there's we, like we just have to be paying attention and the way that it does kind of cross through this area. So I would just like to note somewhere along the way, I think Leedsdale is a it was striking to me. Everybody was pretty clear, like we could run buses up and down Colorado for a clear purpose. I think Leedsdale has a lot more uh, nuance and complexity because of who owns it, who takes care of it, and all, and all that goes with it. So I don't know. I'd, I'd almost like to see like Leedsdale other than kind of the rest of the, kind of these arterials that we're working on, if there was a way to, to think about it differently.
Okay, well, let's go ahead and move on to Quebec. So same question, which travel mode should be prioritized along Quebec Street? Okay, uh, so definitely a little more of a mix here. So um, for folks that chose um, bicycles, let's let's hear from you. So um, uh, why do you think that maybe bicycles should be more of a priority along Quebec Street? And I did see a couple hands go up. So uh, why don't we start with Jim? Um, Jim, whether or not you chose bicycles, uh, why don't you go um, and tell us your thoughts? I'm for bicycles. With a caveat, I also agree with a couple of people who spoke uh, a few minutes ago that the question has to be rephrased, reworded or something because these streets weren't designed specifically to accommodate any of these things in particular. And if you said, great, let's make uh, Quebec more bike friendly. Well, how are you going to do that? I mean, you're going to put them on the sidewalks and because you're certainly not going to put a, be putting them on the street. So, um, Quebec, you know, was designed to move traffic, and that's why it uh, has the lanes that it does and is, is heavily utilized. But uh, I, if I had one thing to say, that this may blow everybody's mind away, but if you, uh, if you really want to improve Quebec, either for cyclists, pedestrians, or whomever, find out a way to disguise or get rid of the waste transfer station. Because that thing is an abomination. And um, Anyway, just wanted to throw that in. Thank you. Uh, Judy, I don't think we've heard from you in a while. Go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? We can, yes. Okay, well, I live on Quebec at the Iowa intersection. So I, I see what goes past my house on a daily basis. Um, we have a park on Quebec at Quebec and Iowa. Um, down the street north, we have a lot of apartments. Uh, Quebec gets used by pedestrians, dog walkers a lot. They head to the park, particularly during uh, the lockdowns and with COVID, um, people were walking a lot. And uh, uh, it is a main arterial, but what goes by my house on a regular basis are ambulances and fire trucks. Um, I don't think it would be a very safe place for bike lanes, to be honest with you. Um, you must realize and maybe do not know this, is that south of us, south of Evans, is a large complex of assisted living facilities, um, nursing homes, um, right after, I think it, or before Yale. And at Yale is, a, is an access point. So I, I have ambulances going by two and three times or more a day. Um, so I, I marked other here because we do have, uh, it is a, um, we do have buses here of going both, no, both north and south. And it is a main arterial between the DTC and I-70, it's a main quarter. And people can go from the north straight down to the DTC. And they can also get to I-25 off of Yale. Um, so I, I, I would like to see 
it be more pedestrian friendly and safer for pedestrians because they do use it a lot, use the walks a lot. So that's one reason why I put other there was it's cars, it's buses, and it's pedestrians, but not bike friendly. Thank Good you. comment. And I think uh, Jared also uh, echoed, I think, um, what's been said earlier by Guadalupe and others about uh, the option of other um, to kind of accommodate, you know, um, multiple uh, priorities along Quebec. Uh, Spencer, I believe you had your hand up next. Yeah, so I selected bike just because when I look at Quebec and when I drive Quebec, you know, it intersects with so many parks. You have, I don't know, probably four or five parks along that stretch within the near Southeast area plan. And then it also intersects with the Cherry Creek Trail. So really, um, it would give bicyclists a better means to get around. I mean, again, it connects all the way to the DTC, connects all the way up to, um, it goes all the way to Evans, if I'm not mistaken. And so, I mean, it'd just be something, or not Evans, but um, Colfax. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of why I picked it. Just, it already lends itself to, you know, getting you to the outdoors in the sense of going to parks and then get you to the trail so you can go east or west in the city. Yeah, just, you know, kind of seems to lend itself to bikes. If we're going to talk about prioritization over the next 20 years, that is. Great, thank you for your comments. Uh, let's see, Lisa, go ahead. Um, I, I, think, I think it could accommodate um, some bikes. It's pretty wide in certain spaces. Once you get south of Cherry Creek, drive south, it's a little bit more uh, problematical, but I, I do feel that could help. Um, you know, I, you know, when I think about Quebec, I don't think about, um, and, and, you know, in the study court, you know, area south of Leedsdale, you know, I'm just going to say again and again, the area between Leedsdale and Evans is just horrible with the bunkers and the um, lack of landscaping and the, um, horrible conditions of sidewalks and bus stops. Um, so when I, when you ask me what travel mode should be prioritized along Quebec, I'm kind of with Paul and same with Evans. This little stretch needs a little bit of a study. Uh, it's, it's really not attractive. And so, you know, that's why people drive Quebec at 45, 50 miles an hour. It's just not, it doesn't even look like a residential neighborhood in some places. <laughs> Great, thank you for your thoughts, Lisa. Um, Harvey, go ahead. Well, I, I live on the north side of, of Leedsdale along Quebec, uh, where it's two lane street. Uh, and I put down buses because there's no bus stop going north on Quebec between Leedsdale and Alameda. Uh, it, there, there's this nothing there, and there, going south there is one at exposition between Alameda and uh, and Leedsdale. Uh, the the challenges that we have at Quebec in that area are that uh, you have the Fairmont Cemetery uh, uh, on one side of the street, which is sacred land and very difficult to. Um, to expand Leedsdale or put add additional lanes. So I, I like that. I put down buses. I really mean transit of some sort, whether there, there are many vans that circum, uh, can, uh, go through the neighborhood, pick people up, or if you're talking about elderly people and, and providing transportation for them and then bringing them back to Leedsdale or over to Colorado Boulevard, Alameda, whatever it happens to be. But I, 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 that's why I chose the uh, buses or again, transit options. Great, thank you for sharing, Harvey. Um, are there any final thoughts on Quebec before we transition? I think Scott has about 15 minutes for a couple of uh, quality of life questions. Well, this was really helpful. So I think, um, thank you for, for your responses. I think a big takeaway is to maybe look at um, kind of the, the questions that we have for these corridors. 
um, and kind of come up with a better way, uh, you know, working with Dottie on the wording a little bit. Um, perhaps it's more of kind of a ranking, um, but I think uh, folks uh, tonight have brought up some really good um, ideas on how we can kind of get a little bit more um, out of these responses uh, when we uh, have, the, have the surveys go live. So thank you for that. And so if um, I don't see anything else in the chat, so why don't we go ahead, Scott, and um, conclude with parks and landscaping. All right, thanks, Jason, and thanks everyone for that uh, good discussion. Uh, as Jason said, we've got a few parks and landscaping questions. We'll see how many we can get through here before eight o'clock. Um, so uh, what we heard around this is you know, near Southeast, as you all know, has a lot of great parks, uh, but there could be improvements made in terms of amenities and improving access. Uh, and then also landscaping can be improved uh, in the area and become more resilient uh, and more sustainable. So uh, we wanna ask about uh, what amenities folks would like to see to improve parks, um, how we can improve access to those parks uh, and where folks would like to see uh, a focus on improved landscaping and how we can prioritize resiliency. So here we have uh, a few options of amenities. We'd like you to tell us your top three choices for what you would like to see in a park near you uh, in terms of uh, new amenities. So more seating options, uh, more athletic fields, soccer fields, baseball fields, things like that. Sport courts like basketball, tennis, um, pickleball, futsal, things like that. Uh, playgrounds for children, dog parks, uh, picnic tables and shelters. Uh, exercise equipment, um, you know, like the, the running tracks where they have the, the stations where you can do sit-ups and pull-ups and things like that. Uh, just regular running and walking trails, uh, improve natural landscaping. Green infrastructure is things like uh, better water, uh, stormwater treatments, um, and then other, obviously, if you have any other ideas. Thank you to everyone choosing dog park parks. I felt less obliged to select it for my work colleagues because you all did. Yeah, unsurprisingly, dog parks is coming in uh, as one of the top choices here. All right, I think that's most everybody who's responded. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about dog parks. Uh, so I don't know if anyone has stuff to add about that um, or running walking trails also got quite a few if there's uh, specifics around that you'd like to discuss, Jared. Yeah, I was just gonna not talk about the dog park. Uh, to my knowledge, there is not a lot of shelters at parks in the near Southeast area. Uh, it seems to be all of the parks that, um, that I am at least recalling and definitely uh, Councilman Cashman and Black, correct me because I'm probably wrong on this, but um, there's not at least a, a seems to be a lot of shelters, uh, maybe over at Cook. Um, but I was just trying to think of if there's any at, at some of the smaller uh, neighborhood parks. Yeah, I know there are some at Cook. I'm not sure about the other parks. Even, even Bible Park with its size doesn't really have any. Uh, Tenza Park is, but Tenza Park's actually about to get some cover, I think. Council member um, Cashman could elaborate more on that. I know it was in the funding. They're planning on adding some kind of cover there. Yeah, we are uh, expected to get uh, a shelter and uh, picnic tables at Potenza and uh, uh, over at the city of Chennai. Yeah, Garland just seems to be uh, a huge park uh, without any shelter. Okay, great comment. Uh, Spencer, did you have any? Other... Yeah, I, I was just going to ask, all the parks, at least on my end of Virginia Village, have running and walking trails. So I'm curious, uh, like from the group, what additional walking or running trails are needed where? Great question. I was going to ask that too. Yeah, anyone who selected running or walking trails have you know, further guidance on what specifically you'd like to see, Erica? Well, for me, Bible Park is the nearest park that I go to often and walk around and run around. 
And um, I prefer to not run on concrete and it would be great. There's a higher up kind of path that's been kind of created on the upper, um, there's an upper area that's dirt, mm -hmm. but it gets incredibly muddy, incredibly um, uneven sometimes. And so it would be great if there was a more, um, a natural type of turf to run on, you know, or even just like a, a, an actual path rather than just kind of something that the trucks drive onto and it makes big ruts. Um, you know, something where it was on uh, the grass, but it was an actual trail. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah, that's good feedback. Thanks. Uh, Dustin. Yeah, just similar to Erica, because Bible Park's the one we frequent the most. Uh, the reason I chose it, I guess, several fold one, just to maintain that, right? So we don't lose what we have. But even expanding, whether it's kind of to Erica's point or take the Bible Park example, you have the concrete footpath down the bottom, you have the muddy perimeter drive. Um, so if you're on the footpath, you're kind of dodging cyclists, runners, walkers, strollers, dogs. Uh, or if you're up the top, you're hoping it hasn't rained or snowed recently, so you don't get covered in mud. So just, I imagine there will be more people coming because that's what we've talk, spoken about before. So with more people using the park, then there's going to be a need for more trails as well. Yeah. Uh, Miranda. Yeah, I put it in the chat, but I think it's, it's less about the quantity and more about the quality, I think. Um, like Cook Park, you could argue has a long trail, but it's falling apart in places. And <laughs> it's just really rutted and, and not pleasant. And then like, for me personally, the Highline Canal Trail would be ideal to run on, except that being a woman alone, like it's the, the growth is way too dense for it to feel safe because it's not used enough. Okay. Uh, Councilwoman Black. Thanks. Um, I use the Highland Canal a lot, um, but I wanted to clarify for the people who commented about the Highland Canal Trail in Bible Park. So the dirt path is actually uh, a service road for Denver Water, and I have had them um, resurface it and even it out, but when we have moisture, it gets rutted. Um, but the plan for all of the Highline Canal, for all 71 miles, is to someday have a 10-foot uh, cement part for cycle for bicycles, and then a 10-foot wide dirt track for runners. And so that is the plan for the Highline Canal. It's just a funding issue, um, but. They are uh, redoing it, I think, right now in the Windsor neighborhood, and they're doing it to that standard. So someday we will see it. Great. Thank you. Uh, Harvey, I think you're next. Well, thanks. Um, I, I chose running and walking trails, not because we need more, but need, because we need to make them safer. Uh, right now, wherever the running and walking trails are, there's a bike path. And either something needs to be designated that these are for bikes and these are for pedestrians because they don't mix well, or at least at least minimally put up signage to tell the walkers that you walk against traffic or with traffic or whatever the rule is out here in Denver. So I, I like that. I just mentioned that because of, of a safety issue rather than we need more of them. Great, thanks. Uh, Spencer, did you have another? Yeah, I was actually just going to comment on the dog parks uh, because I found out last night in the Virginia Village RNO meeting that there's apparently a dog park being discussed at Veterans Park over there off 25. So just something for everyone to consider too. Even though I still think our area needs a dog park. Okay, thanks, Spencer. Uh, Miranda, do you have another comment? No. Nope. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, great, thanks everyone. Uh, let's try to get one more question in here. Oh, Lupe. 
Oh, ahead. sorry, just really quickly. Um, and I guess I'm a little bit, I was torn between natural landscaping and green infrastructure because I certainly want to make sure that we're not adding to the overall kind of, uh, you know, heat island effect. So I think adding to the natural landscape makes a lot of sense. But I was, I was thinking that natural landscaping and green infrastructure can kind of go hand in hand um, in regards to how they're approached. So uh, I would love to see more green infrastructure so that the park is self sustainable but with the idea that natural landscaping is kind of setting the bed, if you will, for, for that, for the green infrastructure to exist in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jenny. Um, I was disappointed that art was not an, an, an item there. So I, I selected other, because I think art in our parks can be um, so many different things. It can be picnic tables and shelters. It could be seating. It could be, um, natural landscaping. I mean, it, it's so many things. So I think art should be added to the list. Yeah, great suggestion. All right. Uh, like I said, let's try to get one more question in here with the last two minutes. Um, so what uh, makes it harder for you to go to a park or to get to a park? Is there one uh, not close to you? Uh, do you want to walk there, but to find it difficult or bike there? or um, take transit there or drive there, but there's something that makes that difficult or just something about the park uh, that makes it feel unwelcoming or unsafe? Uh, or is there any other reason that uh, discourages you from going to a park? Does the weather count? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. All right, it looks like we're getting a few others. Do the folks who said other want to share what they're thinking of? Miranda? Yeah, <clears throat> I selected um, other and difficult to walk there because um, I think they're related. You know, both, I, I have a small pocket park near me, which I like, um, but for the larger parks that I think are more useful for doing things like exercise, um, it requires two to three um, very large crossings and the, the pedestrian, you know, like there's either not a light or the light doesn't last long enough to actually get across the street with a stroller. So that's, that's kind of the other that I selected. Okay, thanks. Uh, Lupe. And I think similar to the previous comment that was made with regards to cycling uh, along uh, kind of Cherry Creek and Holly, is it's that level of intersection. There's there's no there's no level of displacement or uh, awareness other than a light and a crosswalk. And I'm I, I just don't quite honestly I don't trust a lot of the cars that are running through some of these intersections, including that of Monaco uh, at Florida. So uh, we live right in the area. Um, walking to it is a, a great uh, uh, you know. Uh, opportunity for us, but I just fear that something's going to happen uh, with my children crossing that, that crosswalk. Yeah. Uh, Jim. Um, just a, a positive comment. I think the city has done a terrific job providing the sheer number of parks that we have. I think it's real easy to get to one real quickly. So um, I just said, uh, basically, uh, you know, dress them up a bit, you know, I mean, keep, keep dressing them up. They, they, they do a great job. We, we have so many parks to choose from. I think we're very lucky that way. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Nancy. Thanks, Scott. Um, I live a half a block from Cook Park, so I don't have any problem using that park. I think it's a great park. I am excited about improvements to the park with, um, I think there's uh, basketball courts and children's activities. So I'm, I'm really happy with what the city has done with that park or will be doing with that park. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jenny. Um, I have a couple comments. Um, I find it hard to see the, um, 
answers of difficult to take transit there and difficult to drive there because I don't think anyone should have to take transit or drive to any parks. I think that everybody should have access um, walking or biking to a park. Um, and then my other comment is uh, just thinking about this question, I look back with my uh, preschooler and two toddlers and two dogs walking from my house to the nearest park. I wish you all could have seen it. It was traumatic. Um, but I did it on a regular basis because it's healthy for our family to do that. And thank God we all survived. Uh, I am not as lucky as a lot of you uh, to be that close to a park. All right, uh, thanks Jenny and thanks everyone. We're uh, a couple of minutes over eight, so we'll end it there. Uh, thanks for a great discussion again this month. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, please get the word out about the upcoming engagement. Uh, we really want a good turnout at these workshops and good participation in the survey. Uh, and we're really counting on you all to help spread the word. Uh, we will likely cancel March's meeting because it's going to be the day before. It would be the day before the second workshop. It would have been March 9th. Um, so I want to encourage you all to attend the workshops on the 1st and the 10th, and we'll likely cancel the uh, our steering committee meeting uh, that would have fallen in between. Uh, so you're not going to three meetings in, in two weeks. Uh, so like I said, hope to see you all at those workshops on March 1st and March 10th. And we will be uh, in touch about uh, other opportunities to participate and in information. Uh, Scott, will you yeah. be sending out invites for those two workshops or do we have to register for, to, for them? Uh, yeah, it, the registration is up on the website right now. So if you go to uh, the plan website, denvergov.org slash near Southeast plan, uh, you can register for uh, both of those workshops right now. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. Have a good uh, rest of your Wednesday evening and a good February. And I hope to see you all in March. Thanks. Take care, everyone.